Holy Spirit. Loving Heavenly Father. At this time, I pray your cleansing of my heart, my mouth, my mind, of the hearers' hearts and ears and minds. Please, Lord, use me just as an instrument. Speak to each one of us here today so that we may be changed when we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, I think how amazing it is. We see it time and time and time again where we find the Sabbath school lesson and the theme of the day and the sermon all follow a, a theme. Um, and as I listened to the Sabbath school lesson this morning, I was, I was just thinking, God really wants to drive something home with us here today. So, as I say, I, I got this um, preparation to, to, to prepare for a sermon in, in, while I was in London this week. And I didn't have my computer and I didn't have, because usually I will go through a couple of um, subjects and, and try and work it out. But I prayed. I just said, Lord, put, put, tell me what it is. Because I'm going to have such limited time. I need to look it up and then present it because I haven't got time to do all sorts of research and whatever. And, and I just felt deeply impressed to talk about love. And as I thought about it, because it was all contemplation, thinking of different stories in the Bible and thinking of various things, that I thought about love in my life. And um, one, of the, one of the things that came to me, and I believe it was inspirational, was the, um, my mum used to read to us from this book when we were little. It's called Streams in the Desert by Mrs. Charles E. Kerman. And she said it was given to her soon after she was married. Um, and she said it carried her through many, many very difficult times in her life. And then she bought one for me in 19, May 1983. It says to Heather, with love, with our love from mom and dad. I knew my dad was just um, in agreement of <laughs> my mom doing it. And that was when I had, um, 2000, I'm 81. End of 81, I ran away from home and I was away from home at the time. And she said to me, take this book, you'll need it. Carry it with you forever. You know, I haven't read it. I've never read it because I don't read. I really struggle to read. But it was laid on my heart. You want to talk about love, but your mom gave you love and you never read it. And I thought, oh, I know I've kept it because I've treasured it because she said I must, but I haven't read it. <laughs> came home and I looked for it and I decided to look up the, it's actually, um, it's, what do you call it, daily devotionals? So I thought, well, let me, let me find what the reading is. Since God reminded me about the book, let me find the reading for February 12th, which is today. And I will read it. February 12th, the text for the day is Matthew 6, 32. Uh, your heavenly father knoweth. That's it. Your heavenly father knows. This, uh, a visitor at a school for the deaf and dumb was writing questions on a blackboard for the children. By and by, he wrote this sentence. Why has God made me to hear and speak and made you deaf and dumb? The awful sentence fell upon the little ones like a fierce blow in the face. They sat, palsied before that dreadful why. And then the little girl arose. Her lip was trembling. Her eyes were shimmering with tears. Straight to the board she walked and picking up the crayon, wrote with a firm hand these precious words even so father for it seemed good in thy sight what a reply 
It reaches up and lays hold of an eternal truth upon which the maturest believer, as well as the youngest child of God, may alike securely rest the truth that God is your father. Do you, what, uh, do you mean that? Do you really and fully believe that? When you do, then your dove of faith will no longer wander in weary unrest, but it will settle down forever in its eternal resting place of peace. Your father, your father. I can still believe that a day comes for all of us, however far off it may be, when we shall understand with these tragedies that now blacken and darken the very air of heaven for us, will sink into their places in a scheme of august, so magnificent, so joyful, that we shall laugh for wonder and delight. And that was uh, author Christopher Bacon. So she's obviously collected from various people. And then the poem for the day, because every day has a poem, it says, no chance hath brought this ill to me. Tis God's own hand, so let it be. He seeth what I cannot see. There is a need be for each pain. And he one day will make it plain that earthly loss is heavenly gain. Like a piece of tapestry viewed from the back appears to be naught but threads tangled hopelessly. But in the front, a picture fair rewards the worker for his care, providing his skill and patience rare. Thou art the workman, I the frame, Lord for the glory of thy name, perfect thine image on the same. My mum maybe felt that there were a lot of things she couldn't teach me or show me, but she knew that, that this carried treasures of encouragement and strength. She wanted me to have this. And I'm going to try and read it. I'm going to try and carry on from there and see if I can get through the year. So how deep is your love? Because if you, if, if, if we, all of us, if we have various abilities and perceptions about what love is and how it is, and I know uh, Brother Soren had actually once said, Love is a choice and an action you choose. I'm going to love God and I'm going to do what, is, what he's asked me to do. And it's a choice and it's a decision. It's not just a feeling of the, of the heart. But Jesus does give us an emotion with it as well. He wants us to learn how not to rely on the emotion, but to, to know that even when we feel nothing, he still feels everything. And we only need to have the feeling once or twice to know that that's where God is at. Eternal, pure, deep love. So if I can just have a look here. Let's look at, it really intrigued me, that there's so many stories in the Bible of love that are love that are um, difficult love relationships that, that, that Satan is actually very clever. You, this whole LGBTQ, XYZ, whatever, <laughs> has made us more reserved, made us more careful, being suspicious of people and their their kindness and their affection toward us. And I just realized this, how many times I was thinking of the different love stories in the Bible and very few of them actually were a man and a woman. There were some very good love stories that way, but my, 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 my mind was guided first to the story of David and Jonathan. Um, so I just wanted to see uh, if we can go to, if you want to look it up, First Samuel 18, verses 1 to 5. So First Samuel 18, verse 1 to 5. Um, 18, 1 to 5. So we know that David had come to see his brothers in the battlefield. 
he saw Goliath, he, he couldn't understand why people were afraid of him because we got God on our side and no one should be afraid of anything got God on our side. And so um, he then goes and he takes Goliath out with his sling. And while Saul is watching, he's, um, well, let's start reading from verse one and says, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that, that's, that's Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. There's a knitting of souls. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garment, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out hither so ever, whithersoever Saul sent him, and, beha and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. That relationship between um, Saul and Jonathan, David and Jonathan um, is a very touching story. Because we can't go through all the different things that they went through together, but he saved David more than once from his father uh, who planned to kill him. And he very sadly died in the, in the battle that, um, that he was fighting with his father Saul and Saul died. And David wept. David mourned him terribly because he'd lost his friend, his soul mate, his friend. And eventually um, we find where after David is the king, he um, is sitting one day thinking and rem rem remembering the past. And he said, is there no one, no one left of the house of Jonathan? And they say, yeah, he has a crippled son, you know, when they were running away. <laughs> from the onslaught of the army, the, um, the nanny that was looking after him hit him in a well, and in the process, something had fallen and broken his legs. He's now a cripple. And David was so excited to hear there was something of Jonathan still around, still alive. And he said, he must come and live with me in the palace as the son of the king. Um, and he honors that friendship that he had with Jonathan. I want to skip over that one quickly, and I just want to just mention a few others. We've got the beautiful, beautiful love story between Ruth and Naomi. I don't need to go into it because I think we all know what a wonderful thing it was when Naomi, as a young, beautiful girl with her whole life ahead of her, said to her, where you go, I will go. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. I belong to you. A girl to her mother-in-law. How many of us can say of our mother-in-laws that, that, that we love them that much? It's a very difficult thing um, what, that Ruth did, but she was motivated by love. Um, and then we have the story of Esther and Mordecai. A lot of people may not think of it as a love story, but you know, Esther was a, an orphan. She was taken in by Mordecai. And she loved Mordecai, and Mordecai loved her. But it's only apparent later in life because when he, when she hears he's disturbed, she's heartbroken. And when he hears she's disturbed, he's heartbroken. You think, isn't it how lovely how much they love each other and they trust each other? Because he, Mordecai, entered her in amongst the maidens to be selected for queen. That was something that would maybe make me think, well, how much do you love me that you're putting me up on a, on a beauty parade? You know, I really would have a question with that. But Mordecai also, like, like all these other greats of the Bible, loved God first. And he sought to do the will of God. He worked for the king and he accepted. I am a captive in this land and this is the king God has placed over me. Whatever is... God brings is for my good and I will like the deaf and dumb child because it's good and you know the father says it's okay 
So I'm here. And this is what I'm going to do. And this is what the king needs, a prince. The best woman I can think of is my Esther. And she gets selected. It is beautiful to see how that relationship between Esther and Mordecai works for the good of God. We can go on and we go to the story of, um, I do want to skip over a couple. I'm going to go to this, the New Testament and look at the story of Jesus. Um, <laughs> you know, he could have, he, he could have made it, he went through the wilderness by himself. He could have carried on doing it by himself, but he chose 12 companions to walk it with him. And it's interesting to see when there's that dispute about who's going to sit next to the throne in heaven that James and John assumed they were senior. And there's many writings that indicate that Peter assumed he was superior. You know, the best, who do you love the most? We always think well, there's got to be one of us that's the one. You know, we can't all be the same. But in all truth, every single one of those disciples must have thought in his heart, I know he loves me. I know he loves me. I'll be the one who sits at his right hand. Because he loved. He loved genuinely. And everybody that was close to him felt loved. So it's no wonder there's an argument. Because you say, no, I, I, he loves me. And he's saying, yeah, but he loves me. And I, nobody loves me. Those disciples really felt the love of Jesus. Did it change them? No, because they're arguing amongst themselves. No, he loves me. No, he loves me. I'm the great. I'll be. You watch and see. He's going to make me. It didn't change them to feel that love. And the point comes, their hearts had to get broken first. When their hopes, their dreams, everything that they were putting on him, this wonderful, loving Jesus who would heal everybody and cast out all the demons and take his kingdom. And I'm going to be right up there with him because he chose me amongst the 12. But when he was killed, they fled. Their hearts had to be broken. Peter denied him at the trial three times before the cock crowed. Did they not love him? Of course they did. He said, I mean, if he was going to be brave, he was brave. He cut the, the servant of the high priest's ear off with his sword to defend Jesus. But was, was that a contrite heart? Later on, Peter died a martyr's death. And it wasn't an, uh, a, hard, a difficult thing for him to do. From pulling a sword to denying Christ to dying a martyr's death with absolute love for Jesus. You know, it's very sad because there are people in this world who try and take the story of David and John, I mean, of uh, Jesus and John, and, and, and mucky it up. They mucky it up. But Jesus was trying to say, love is essential. Because if you can't love your brother, your sister in Christ, you have not understood the love of Christ. Um, I want to then go back from from Jesus, and we'll come back to Jesus again. But I want us to go now to uh, First Kings uh, chapter eighteen. Um, And we find the story of um, 
the climax of Elijah's life. I'm not going to read it all, but we he he uh, had prayed. Elijah prayed, Lord, shut up the heavens. Don't let it rain. These are an evil people. They don't deserve to eat. He, he went and said, I'll take it. I'll take it, the message to the king myself. And he went and he said to the king, it will not rain for three years to show you that your uh, adultery has reached up to God. He's cared for in the wilderness. He comes out of the, in, by the brook Cherith. And when he comes down, the, he, he gets fed by the widow. But he's in God mode. God, he loves God with all his heart. He's willing to lay down his life, everything to, de to, to, to defend the honor of God, even to use his faith to ask God to close the heavens in his zealous desire to bring the children of Israel back to the true worship of the true God. Now he's, he's, he's called them to come with all the prophets of Baal. They go to Mount Carmel. They make the sacrifice to Baal and they build an altar to God. And they say, we will see who's really God. And do you know that day Elijah slew 800 prophets of Baal? He did, he wasn't going to take the evilness of these prophets of Baal who were causing Israel to sin against God of heaven. And you know, I think also of um, when I was thinking about the anger, not anger, but the righteous anger of Elijah when he did what he was doing, but in, in all instances, and um, I re was reminded about Lot. Do you know Lot was actually a judge in the gate of Sodom and Gomorrah? He was a judge telling people, you know, you've got to do this and that because he knew the Lord God. And we are no different to Lot today because we're sitting in a world as Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think anybody would argue too far about that. And when you're doing the like lot judging and saying, you know, this is a sin and that is a sin and this is a sin. But has it changed anything in our heart? Did it change anything in Lot's heart where he said, I need to take my family away from this? There's a depth, there's a deepness of love for God that would make us less like Lot and more like Elijah who would take action. But when I say that, is that love for God where Jesus says, when they said, what is the greatest commandment? It says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy might and thy neighbor also, or thy neighbor as thyself, depending where you read it. It's tagged on. And you almost feel that Elijah doesn't mention family, doesn't mention friends. He's a loner. He's walking with God. He lives out of time. He prays and he talks to God all day and he gets on with his work and him and God are doing it together, just him and God. And that takes him to a level of compassion and love with God that we probably haven't understood yet. And now Jezebel promises to, to kill him and he runs away and he goes into the wilderness. And long story short, there's this whirlwind, there's an earthquake, whatever. And then God speaks to him in a still small voice. He says, what are you doing here? And we can go to Second Kings chapter 19. And let's start at verse 14. And Elijah, if we could maybe look a little bit before that. Oh, yeah, this is answer 14. 
And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. He was jealous, okay? Because the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down my altars, slain my prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, un, uh, well, comest anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mohmehoda, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So he's saying, go and anoint him to take over from you. And, uh, and it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haz Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him who escapeth from the sword of Je Jehu shall Elisha slay. And yet I have me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Slash, you're not the only one. Now, that was exactly the same dispute the disciples had had, where they felt that that relationship was special between Jesus and them. And Elijah felt that the relationship between him and God was special to them. And God's basically saying, there's 7,000 more like you. Um, that must have come as a bit of a surprise to him because he was too busy with his relationship between him and God to actually look around and see. He was judging, judging homosexuality, uh, Baal worship, offering children to sacrifices. He was right, right to be offended and cross with all of those things. But there was, there was, there was something that I picked up was a problem. Really? Do you see a problem? Let me tell you why I think there's a problem. Because here we go on to verse 19, and it says how he came out of the mountain. He went and he found Elisha. He took off his cloak and chucked it over him while he was plowing in a field. And he ran after Elisha and said, can you wait for me to first say goodbye to my family? And Elisha said, well, I didn't say anything. Because all he'd done is he'd cast his cloak on, on top of him. And so he slew the oxen that they were plowing with, and they used the, 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 the implements to cook the meat of the, of the oxen. Um, and, and he said farewell to them, and he left that life behind him. And he went with Elijah. And so I found it interesting that although now he's anointed Elisha, he doesn't, it, 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 he carries on doing his work. And it's very difficult to work out how long he carried on being the prophet in Israel because we find that whole story of Nabal happens when Elisha has been anointed, but he, Elijah deals with it. There's, there's wars. Elisha's there, he's anointed, but Elijah deals with it. I tried to do some quick calculations, but I ran out of time. I would guess that Elisha had been anointed and walked with Elijah for five to 15 years because you see Ahab still has wars. Then Ahab dies and his son comes to reign. Uh, and the son is the one who tried it when he got sick. He sent messengers to go and find out from the gods across in the neighboring countries, if he was going to live or die. And Elijah intercepts him and he says to him, what, are you going to a foreign god to go and ask like God, there's no god in Israel? No prophets in Israel? And they said, uh, well, we've been sent on strict instructions. This is, well, go back. Go back and tell the king. I want to know, have we got no god in Israel? This is Elijah. Elijah's been there for how long now? Elijah's still the man. <laughs> then he goes, uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is the king says, what does this man look like? He says, was very hairy and he had a 
girdle of leather around his waist. He says, oh, that's Elijah. So he knew that his father had had to deal with Elijah and he knew who Elijah was. But he was like his father Ahab and he was worshipping foreign gods and he wanted a word from them. Anyway, all of this happens and Elisha's there and Elijah's there. And eventually you can kind of work out, it's like five, 15, anything, five to 15 years. And I've thought about that. Why did, you know, you'd think that God would say, okay, go and anoint Elisha and then I'll take you out of the situation because you and me, you know, we're close, we're good friends. I'll just take you because we know that Natalie, he did, he took him because he loved him and they had a close relationship. But he wasn't ready. Why wasn't he ready? He hadn't learned how to love his fellow man. And when he walked with Elisha, he learned how to love a man. And we know this is confirmed because when he's taken up in the cloud, if we can go to our scripture reading, well, actually, let's, let's read that whole section. I think it's uh, 2 Kings 2, one, from, from verse 1. We'll just read it, um, 2 Kings 2, verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, yea. I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here. I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to, me to Jordan. And he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they two went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by the Jordan and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the water and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they had gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I take away, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they went, uh, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the husband thereof. And, and he saw him no more, and he took hold of his clothes, his own clothes, and he rent them in two pieces. Elisha was heartbroken. Elijah had experienced the love of a fellow man with Elisha. From, with Elisha. Elijah had been, had learned about God from Elijah and Elijah had learned how to love his fellow man from Elisha. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and thy neighbor also. Takes me to a verse, I knew it was there, I had to look for it. I mean, a quote from a spirit prophecy and it says, and this, this, has been the subject of our Bible studies the last two weeks. It says, 
This is Ellen White, Review and Herald, March 9, 1905. Let us strive with all power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. And let us do all that we can to help others gain heaven. The language is very specific and very um, similar to love the Lord, the God with all the heart and all thy soul and thy neighbor also. So whilst we can strive to be amongst that, that, that 144,000 who love like Elijah, if we can go to the last book of, um, of the Old Testament, Malachi, uh, um, it's Micah, Malachi um, the very last verses here, we look at verse uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a plague. And we know that that was fulfilled in John the Baptist when Jesus came the first time. But the great and awful day of the Lord is the judgment and this final coming with his reward with him. And before that final day, Jesus is going to raise up Elijah. That 144,000 is representative of that Elijah. We have, we have to look at the life of Elijah. We have to first seek, love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind. And when we do that, we can learn how to love our neighbor also, our fellow man. There's another quote on the 144,000 that says they stood four square and all 144,000 were in total agreement, total harmony. And that comes because of the priority. Love the Lord, the God, with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind. And love the neighbor also. Do everything you can to stand amongst the 144,000. And having done that, make sure to, to try and gain, get, help your fellow man to gain entry to heaven. We, we have a tall order. And, and it's not good to debate and to get stuck. And there's another quote. And I brought this in just so that I could maybe remember, maybe say it. So that we don't get bogged down. So, Brother Soren, you know this book because I think you gave it to us. <laughs> um, and this page 269, in this paragraph, it says, it is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which shall not help them spiritually, such as who is to compose 144,000. This, this, those who are the elect of God will a short time now Without question, no, short time, no, without question. So he, it will become plain to us. It's not plain now, but she's already said to us, strive to be among them. And so to strive to be among them is to be like Elijah. And we'd all do good to study the life of Elijah and be more willing to be unaffected by the bad things that are happening around us in terms of who we are, but in terms of making sure that we are speaking for God. And I leave there with uh, my prayer for you today. Jesus paid it all. Jesus took our stripes. With his stripes, we are healed. We don't have to go back like a dog to its form. Let's move up, forward. Put your eyes on him. And we will get there. If you're aiming for 144,000 and you miss it, you'll still gain entrance. Thank you. Your love in our hearts so that we will always remember when we are tempted to do wrong or to give up or to feel self-pity that you have loved us with a love so great that it's not worth passing it up. May we long for it with every fiber of our being. May it your love change us from day to day into your perfect likeness. So when people meet us, they will know they have been with Jesus. It's our desperate prayer we pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Amen. Good morning.
Where's our boys and girls? We've got one, two, three. Where's Maya? Oh, I'm Maya. <laughs> five. No, hang on, I've got lost count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six here. How many have we got online? Three or oh, one on the floor. Three. Right. I'm really glad to see all the boys and girls came to worship Jesus today. Let's sing our song. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Today's story is about a boy. I'm going to guess he was about 10, named, I think I'll call him Tom because I forgot his name. Ha, that's not doing too good because I'm forgetting already. So let's say Tom is about 10. Tom had a problem, big problem. If he saw something he liked, he had to have it. And that made him a bit of a thief. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? But if he saw it, he liked it so much, he couldn't leave it. He knew they wouldn't give it to him, and he just had to steal it. Do you know, from the time he was so little, he could hardly even talk, he was doing it. Walking in the shop and sneaking sweets in his pocket. And his dad was getting really desperate. And his mom and dad talked together. What can we do? They made him write letters of apology. They made him go back to the shop and give the stuff back. They got him. They made him go to sleep with no food. They grounded him. They took his toys away from him. Eventually, one day, his dad said to him, well, I'm going to have to do something that's going to make you remember. And so took him in the room, and he beat him with his belt. And he beat him. Do you know what wasn't wasn't a few days later and he was stealing again. And the dad just didn't know what to do. Called his son and he said, Come son, let's go to let's go to my room. And they went to the room. Dad starts taking off his shirt. Starts thinking, well, are we gonna box? Huh? Anyway, he goes, takes his shirt off takes his belt off and gives the belt to Tom. And then he kneels down by the bed and he says, go on, Tom, hit me. Tom says, no, I can't hit you. You've done nothing wrong, Dad. I can't hit you. He says, hit me, Tom. And Tom picks up the belt and he's trembling and he's crying. And he swings the belt, but it just pats his dad's back. And he says, harder, Tom. Harder, Tom. <coughs> and Tom swings it again. And he screams, harder, Tom. Harder, Tom. And again. And then he sees the welts coming up on his dad's back. And he's saying, please, dad, no, dad. I can't do any more, dad. And he said, harder, Tom. Tom hit him again really hard and then he collapsed on the floor, crying, begging his dad, dad, I can't do it, I can't do it, please dad, don't make me do it. His dad got up and sat next to him on the floor and waited for him to stop crying. When he finished crying, he said, son, let's talk man to man. He said, Jesus took our punishment for us. And with his stripes, we are healed. And unless I can break your heart, that you can understand what it's like when you love somebody and you have hurt them, 
and you really understand what that's like, you will know how you're hurting me, your father, and how you're hurting your heavenly father. And when you understand that, Tom, I hope it will break your heart so that you never steal again. I was about eight years old when I heard that story and it stayed in my head forever. And the man that told the story said, I'm that little boy. And he says, I never stole again. And now I'm a pastor today because I, my heart was broken. Jesus, by his stripes, by the stripes Jesus took, he paid for our sins. And when we understand that by sinning, we are striking him anew, we will look at sin differently and we will stop doing it. Thank you very much, boys and girls, for listening to the story today. And I hope that it touches your heart and you think about it until you get as old as me. Okay? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus.